Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Started in clay class in high school. Did some wheel work, did some hand building. Well, I guess I kind of found it relaxing. I enjoyed that part of it. Done some painting and stuff, drawing, but the the 3D work is really kind of what I really like to do, whether it's with clay or um, working with metal or tiles. Went to college. I wanted to be a life flight medic, and I took art. I took a pottery class and just ended up doing it all the time, and it's kind of where it kind of grew from there. Found a therapeutic, have a, um, a lot of loss in my life, so it seems like I can uh, kind of bury myself in the studio and kind of work through things, which is kind of nice. I'm centering the clay, uh, make sure I got the right depth. I like to trim my platters so that they can hang on the wall. I think people, um, give them a choice of whether they want to use it as a functional piece of pottery or if they want it for a piece of art. So I went to Normandale Community College and I was a two-year college. Got my two-year degree there. I was a firefighter for almost eight years. Worked on an ambulance. I had this desire to finish college so I decided to move up to Bemidji to get an environmental studies degree. Kind of the same thing happened there. I was working on that degree and ended up in the studio all the time. Before all said and done, I had a four-year art degree and a minor in environmental studies. Right now, I'm just making sure that the wall is even. So on the platters, they like to, when you lay them down, they like to bow out if you don't, if you, if they're just some little flaws. They're kind of sensitive when you, when you do it. Some people like to do a, a platter that has a real wide bottom and then they just do little sides on it. I like, I like to have more of a form to them. So my, my um, platters have a narrower foot on them and not so much of a flat bottom. So it's kind of taste, I'm, you know, it's my, I guess it's probably more my personal taste than anything. I think it looks more elegant. I pay attention to detail a lot because I think that if people are gonna buy this for a piece of art, it should have that extra effort to kind of complete it and clean it up and that kind of thing. I think that because I had already worked corporate job, I had a corporate job for a while and I, you know, as a firefighter and I'd already worked some jobs that even though I don't, I, I like working, I didn't find joy in the work. And so I found joy in doing this. It seems like in some of your jobs you're, you're working f for somebody above you and now I'm working for people that want to enjoy what I do, you know. I guess I find more peace in that. Kind of the limitation with platters is getting them in the best kiln. Once they're dry, they can't be wider than on mine anyways, 22 inches. Then you end up, you lose about a, an inch over a foot through drying and firing. Now, kind of see that this is starting to get this nice curvage to it, you know? More of a, what I call elegant look. I think distinctively uh, with my work, I think my people gravitate towards my platter work a lot because I really enjoy what I can do with them. They give me so much more options to use them kind of as a canvas. I guess it's, I look at them as a canvas and I can do different things in them. Or it seems like a vertical vase, you know, it seems like it limits you. You're kind of working on a, a, a surface that's up and down. And I'll just take and trim a little bit of this out so you get a nice line through here and a narrower foot that sits on a centerpiece on a table. 
has some form to it, gives off some light on your table. Uh, for uh, service, it's um, paint your own pottery. And that's pre-made pre molded items. Anything, plates, bowls, cups, soup cups. Dogs, cats, dinosaurs, horses, turtles. Pretty much any, any kind of animal and functional wear um, I have. What that entails is you're painting, but you're not using paint. You're using an underglaze, colored underglaze, and I have several different colors. And then they can draw their designs if they're making special gifts. A Cub Scout troop came in and they did a, for a merit badge. I've had homeschoolers come in, kind of to learn a different part of art that they aren't exposed to. Done birthday parties and work parties, wheel lessons. I don't so much set up classes for wheel training, but I do a lot of um, either one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, so it's more personalized. I don't rent out studio space because I'm kind of limited. There's kind of just, with, there's a lot of different things going on in here. So <clears throat> it's just kind of what fits the space, what fits my personality, I guess. I like to teach. I think in, a, I, in my ideal world, I would actually like to build a bigger facility that's more community orientated. That's what I would like to do. Something where I can offer a lot of different classes and offer different types of studio packages and things like that. You know, if that were ever to happen, that'd be cool. That'd be, that's like my ultimate goal. I haven't made anything bulbous in a while. There was one year all I did was made bulbous forms. <laughs> I just wanted to see how far I could get it out each time without making it tall. That's a cool thing about college. You get a chance to do a bunch of stuff you probably wouldn't do in the studio. You're taking more chances, you know? I want to make pots that are as tall as I am. I want to stand on a ladder and make a pot because it's just that high. And I would say that for me, the best, the, my favorite part of the whole process is actually glazing. I prefer glazing than throwing. It's probably odd for most to hear that out of a professional potter. As a general rule, I like to get it looking like melted ice cream. Um, some I run a little thinner, some of my glazes. Some of the glazes I go a little thicker. I use this pan so I can do bigger pieces. I put a wax on the bottom and then dip them in there. Glaze. The wax that goes on the bottom is a um, just canning wax that you would use to can vegetables. I also use the same wax for designing, which you'll see later. The wax resists the glaze so that I don't have to wipe so much glaze off the foot so it doesn't stick to the shelf when I put it in the kiln. I'm always in the store looking, looking at what colors are in, shapes. It's kind of an obsession, uh, obsession to pick up pottery and, and look at it, whether it's the stamped out stuff from China or stuff that's handmade. I'm not particular. I'll go into a restaurant and look under the plate I'm eating off of and check out the cup I'm drinking out of. And I think the, when I run into the stuff that really intrigues me, I'm hoping that somehow my visual memory will just store it and then kind of make its own creation out of it sometime down the road. I normally don't take sketches or pictures of stuff. Now this is a red iron oxide base glaze it's called Tomoku. There's several variations of it. Um, the one I'm using is more of a, the traditional one. Uh, they used a, a different variation of this one up at Bibinji State. You can see what the wax does. 
Yeah, I make all my glazes from uh, powders. The only store-bought glazes I use are on the electric firing and the low fire, low uh, low range firing for paint your own pottery. The high firing, I, I mix all my own glazes. So I'm gonna do a change in my base glaze to what's called a, a chino <clears throat> or a carbon trap. And it has different characteristics. It's not a it's not a runny fluid glaze. It's more of a a stable kind of glaze, yes. Now I'm gonna do the design work. Ones with the Tomoko on them, on the Chino ones, I'm gonna do more of a pouring design. I use a, I use a wax design on these. The wax doesn't change the color of the glaze. I use a wax design on that one it leaves a mark where the wax is, which is kind of cool if that's the effect you want, but I, I want to keep away from the wax uh, marks on the, uh, those ones this time. All right, let's make some designs. I just got a regular hair, hair brush, paint brush. You can see the wax goes right on top of the glaze. Good thing about the wax, see if you mess up the design, you can get it off and do it start over again, or if you get little trails. Yeah, the wax is for a controlled line. So when I put on the next color, so if I want to use multiple colors for the overglaze, so I can put a, one color here, one color here, and one color here, th three different colors. Now that just looks like a, a mess. But when I, so when I do the colors, you get more of a different flow on each one of them. I try to concentrate on flow. I like things to move through normally or to have some kind of action going on. So this will be my last one I put wax on. And we'll go to uh, we'll go to glazing. All right, so I'm gonna put the um, put the middle glaze on first. Sometimes I like to look on the glaze to see if I see something. And I'll actually kind of follow some of the, the glaze will leave little trails and little st things. And sometimes I'll even make my designs based on the, what the glaze is doing. This is the fancy dancy pour method. Very complicated. I'll use the wax as my You can see what the wax does. Was able to keep the, for the most part, little bonuses there. Well, the nice thing about this is uh, the middle one is the hardest. The end ones are easier. Now, earlier when I was throwing, I was talking about how I like the elegance of that. There's the, the other reason is I like something to hold on to when I do this glazing method. So I actually got this measured um, to my hand. It's going to be somewhere between a tan and a brown. Then on the one side I'll have red and on the other side I'll have blue. So in an abstract world the red I'm putting on now would represent uh, probably like a night sky uh, sunset where it gets really kind of a ready orange. Um, this would be more of the meadow and then the water. You got sun, so basically you got the sunset, a meadow, and then uh, the water in front. I love blazing. Love making designs, looking at the pieces. I mean, this one's kind of a set, kind of a setup one. Kind of wanted, I knew what I wanted to do. So this would be the last color for both of them. I got seven studio glazes, so all my glazing is a variation of seven different glazes. I have some people that buy it, and they tell me right off the bat that all they're going to do is put it in their hutch or hang it on the wall or whatever they're going to do with it. And I have some people that are like. 
but how do I stick it in the oven? You know, so it goes both ways. I would say that it's a mix, a very good mix. I don't know what the full mix is. I, I have family members that won't use it. And I'm like, just use it. If it breaks, I'll get you another one. And they just, oh, I can't use it. And that's that. Voila. So this is, uh, this is called a car kiln. Um, it was made, uh, it was built here right on site by uh, Donovan Palmquist down the cities. And it's built of uh, soft brick and hard brick. And it's gas fed, natural gas. And the reason it's called a car kiln is because it, it's on wheels. Nice. Reds are a little darker. This is a, one of the ones we glazed in the, in the studio the other day. So that's what it turns out with after the wax design and the different glazes. Um, this kiln takes about 21 hours from the time I start it until the time it's done. That's kind of the neat thing about opening the kiln is seeing all the different oddities. See on this side of the kiln, this red worked really nice and on that side it got a little darker. So every time I open the kiln, it's like Christmas. Never know what you're gonna get. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org. If you have segment ideas pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund by the vote of the people on November 4, 2008.